Good afternoon, everyone. This is Leah Smalley. I'm the Assistant Director of Financial Aid Services here at the Coordinating Board. And I just wanted to welcome you to the third webcast. And I'm very excited. We've had a lot of people participating in these, and we're getting good feedback that this information is very useful. So um, thank you again for joining us. Hopefully you can see my screen up right now. I'm going to be going through a variety of topics today. And so one of the requests that I have is that this time um, we're going to wait till the very, very end. And what I'm going to do on questions is circle back to each topic. That way, if there are specific questions, we can kind of keep those categorized instead of hopping all over around based on people's individual questions. Um, and then also my disclaimer that we have a lot of different institution types on the call, which means that some of your questions may not be related to all the schools. And so sometimes those questions are better um, answered on one-on-one, -on -one, either through a conference call or through a contact us, which I'm going to show you in, in towards the end on how you can send one of those to us. But those are just my upfront requests is that if you have questions, jot them down, and then I'm going to try and go through the presentation, and then at the end, we'll circle back. So let's get started. So today's agenda, we're going to briefly just give you a quick legislative update on where the session is at. We're going to discuss the 1920 program guidelines and kind of the timeline on when the remainder will be released. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the authority to transfer process since we don't have a lot of schools that have historically done this um, transfer and it's going to be more uh, popular this year we anticipate with some of the changes to the elimination of reallocation. We're also going to be discussing the year-round grant guidance that came out um, to make sure that people understand kind of uh, what it means and also some future updates on the 1920 year-round guidance. And then I'm going to be going through a very brief demo on how to pull award history for your grant programs and then how to access some of our portals since a lot of these things that we're going to be talking about have to do with individual logins and we do have a lot of new people in the field right now so I want to make sure that I touch base and so people know how to get access to things. And then lastly, like I do each webcast, just talk about some upcoming events and deadlines. All right, so let's get started with the legislative update. As you may be aware, uh, we are very close to the end here. Um, we are still in the session, which ends at the end of May. So that's why we have the green go. There's nothing that has become a law yet. Um, everything is still very active. There are certain bills that are higher priority or that have more momentum than others. But in general, all the bills are still active until the session ends, which will be officially on May 27th. But since that falls on a holiday, um, we do anticipate that it will go to the end of May. Um, I have also that June 16th is when the, is the last day that the governor can sign or veto, veto bills, and that is uh, so that's when the regular session officially everything goes into law. So you'll want to keep an eye out for that. Um, I went on this website last time. It's my TLO, and I'm going to recap that again for everyone because I want to make sure that people know if you are following the session, some of the useful resources that are out there. So when this pops up, this is the main Texas legislator online. You can do basic bill searches up here by clicking on bill search and then up on the top right hand corner, you can type in the bill that you're tracking and then it will pull up all of the history and all of the, the background information that you may find pertinent just to see where it's at. And then under my TLO, you can actually set up alerts and track some of the bills that um, you want to keep an eye on instead of changing it every single day or going back every single day to check it. It'll just simply notify you when um, your bills are going through the process. So uh, another thing that I wanted to show y'all is that on the legislative process on the home page, there is this dates of interest, which I found helpful because it, it tells you exactly when to expect things in the session. And even though we're kind of wrapping things up, it does help for future sessions to just kind of understand the overall process. So as you can see, again, the regular session ends and then there's that June 16th date I, I mentioned. Um, so again, just some resources for everybody and 
again, because each institution is tracking different bills based on interest and things that may impact them. Um, I didn't want to necessarily go over too many of the bills, but if you have questions on a specific bill and you want to know more about it, one, ask your management um, within your institution, but if you need to know from the coordinating board's perspective or any information on a bill, you can always send a contact us inquiry, which again, um, we use as our main source of communication with institutions. So uh, if you have a question on the session, and you go to any of our websites, I'm gonna pull it up. This is our main student financial aid programs website. At the very top of the page is the online inquiries and you can submit questions to us through this contact link. From here, you'll select institution, you'll type in, um, begin typing the name of your institution and then what your question is. Under contact reason, make sure to select financial aid questions so that it gets routed to our area. We have a lot of different departments and areas within the coordinating board and unless you select this, it's going to get routed somewhere else um, and then it'll eventually make it to us. So um, once you do all the contact information, when you submit it, we will review it, route it to the appropriate person and get you a response. So that's how that works. Okay. So um, that's just, a, like I said, a quick update on the session. The program guidelines. We were able to release two of the program guidelines um, this last week on May 2nd, excuse me. We released the Texas College Work Study and the Educational Aid Exemption Program. Um, we are set to release the Texas Grant and TEOG. Our goal is to get those out this week if possible. If not, it would be early next week. So we'll want to keep an eye out for those. And then TEG, our three loan programs, which is the College Access Loan, the Texas Beyond Time, and the Texas Armed Services Scholarship Program. Those three, as, long, as well as the Work Study Mentorship Program, all of those are still pending approval right now. So as soon as we have those finalized, we will be sending the notice out and we'll post those on SFAP. So disclaimer, so what changed on the guidelines? On both webcasts I believe I mentioned that we were going to try and provide clarity to the selective service statement. So um, again I ask you to hold your questions to the end if this is always a hot topic for everyone um, but this did get released uh, in the guidelines and they will be in each of the versions that go out same exact guidance and we put this in there this year to distinguish when a statement is not required and when a statement is required. We get a lot of questions on, you know, when do I collect it and when do I not collect it? So on a lot of our prior trainings and things that we've released, we've tried to kind of um, draw a line in the sand on when you need to do it when you don't. Um, so we tried to, again, make it clearer this year. And we understand that there's challenges with collecting the statement. Uh, we're looking at ways to reduce those challenges or eliminate this process. But as of right now, it's written into statute. And to meet that statutory requirement, we did incorporate in this language and this process so that um, schools could collect the statement and have as, as little administrative burden as possible. Again, we realize that that is not um, always the case at each school. People have different resources and abilities to do things. So if you need assistance or you have specific questions to your school, feel free to reach out and we can go through that with you. But in general, um, what we've published this year is that if the student completes their FAFSA and it goes through the database match online and it comes through on their ICER as matching and that they are registered, no statement is needed and no documentation is needed. It's already gone through the check and their signed statement is considered the FAFSA. It's only when the FAFSA is rejected and it basically doesn't have their selective service status on it um, you would need to collect the statement and then confirm registration or exemption. Um, and then, of course, if the student does not complete a FAFSA, for example, your TASFA students, um, your competitive scholarship, there's other exemption and waiver programs, there are times when you're going to have to collect the statement and confirm that registration. So. Um, another question that came through is, well, what about reprocessed ICERs? Uh, would that would that 
require me be fulfilled if it has that cleared, but it went through a reprocessing um, step? And the answer is yes. If the ICER goes through or for example, if you make a correction to their date of birth or they have a name issue or social security issue and you fix that or you're doing verification and it runs back through the database, database match process and it comes back on the other side saying that they're registered, then no, you would not need a statement or any documentation because it, it successfully did that match. So, um, I like I said at the end of the webcast, if you have questions specific that would um, that the whole community, the financial aid community, community would benefit from, if you want to type those at that point, I'm going to go ahead and move forward, and then we can circle back. So another thing in the program guidelines that you'll see in Texas College Work Study and then the three grant programs was a, of a slight change to authority to transfer. And I wanted to go through this because not a lot of schools use authority to transfer, either because just uh, you're unaware or the timing of it. And since the elimination of reallocation went away and we have different timelines now, I wanted to kind of go through it with you so you know what your options are. So the authority to transfer process is when um, you have a combination of Texas College Work Study and one of the three grant programs. And the way that the rule is written is that a school can transfer up to 10% of your total annual allocation or $20,000, whichever's less, between the programs within the fiscal year. Um, so in prior years, we had the authority form transfer form, excuse me, on the website and within our guidelines. But again, what we were finding is that it was usually too late to submit that um, and the form was not always completed the right way and then it took a lot of back and forth to get it correct. So this year, what you'll notice is if you're interested in moving money between programs, you'll send a contact us, which I just showed you previously, and you'll send a financial aid question requesting that you want to do a, a transfer between programs. Now, the deadline on which to submit the authority to transfer request is different depending on what you want to do. If you're looking to transfer from grants to work study, it's January 18th, and this is for 1920. If you're wanting to move work study to grants, it would be June 14th. Now, we had a couple schools say, hey, you know, I really want to do it this year uh, for 1819, but the deadline's already passed. And I did want to clarify on when we get to uh, a future slide for work study to grants, um, we are going to allow that one since it, there's no statutory or rule regulation behind that. And once we get to that slide, I can explain further on how that will um, work for you and your school. So let's talk about these a little bit. So. Ooh, I just went right through there. I'm sorry. <laughs> My mouse got away from me. Okay. So let's talk about moving money from grant to work study. Um, based on program rule, work study funds have to be encumbered by February 20th. And so what that means is that in order for us to move money in time, there has to be a set deadline to calculate the amount, get the funds moved, and then pay it out so that you can encumber. So the way we have it set now is that the institution would submit a request through Contact Us by January 20th of that year. So this will be the upcoming year. Um, what we'll do is we will look at your allocation, determine the amount that you could qualify for, and then we'll notify you of that total to determine what amount you want to move over based on eligibility. Once we agree on that amount, we'll send you the authority to transfer form that you'll then sign to approve it. And then once we get the approved form, we'll move the money from your grant program into your work study and issue those funds out, just like we do every year. We'll issue the check will be transferred either ACH or however you receive your funds. Um, that will get sent to you. And then you would have to use funds during the academic year, and that would mean either fall or spring. Since most people request this in the spring term, it would have to be expended during the spring term. And we have had a few schools say, well, what about can we use the funds um, for work study during the summer? And unfortunately, the only way to use those is if there's a reallocation. And for the past, since I've been here, the past three years, we haven't done a work study 
reallocation. So the funds do have to be spent during the fall and spring terms. That's how it's listed in rule. Um, so for this particular process, if you're wanting to move grant funding into work study, it has to be done very early on in the year so that we can move the money before the February 20th deadline, which is again written in rule. So um, that process is not that common. We don't have a lot of schools that want to move their grant money into work study. What we do have is schools that are going to potentially have work study money left over once this spring term ends in the next few weeks that would have the potential to move that into their grant program. Um, so typically, either during the FADS process or once your payroll ends at the spring term, you're like, hey, wait a minute, I have this work study money back. And so in the past, you've sent those funds back to us. We move it back into the program and we move forward. Well, we technically, we don't want your work study money back. We want y'all to be able to use it. So with this process, we will now be able to move that into your grant program, which you'll be able to use until August 1st, because again of the, the elimination of reallocation, you get to use your money longer. So again, even though this is published for 1920, for 1819, we are allowing schools to do this process. We'll just need to collaborate as a team to make sure that we calculate the amount appropriately and we move the money over. So the way it will work is you'll send a, a request through Contact Us confirming you know, basically how much money you have left over from your allocation. Say, hey, this is how much. What we do is we look at your original allocation. We do the calculation to see how much can you possibly get, 10% or 20,000, whichever is less. Um, once we discuss that, you'll send your either ineligible money that you have not used or however much you're planning to transfer based on eligibility. You'll return that work study money to the coordinating board. Once we receive that, we will then do the transfer into the appropriate grant program. Um, you'll, of course, sign the authority to transfer form authorizing that transfer. And then once it's approved and we move it into that, um, that bank account, you will then draw down funds like you normally do. You'll send the funds requests through to us, and then we will send you those funds, which do have to be requested by August 1st. I think that that covers it. Um, again, we will circle back on this um, to see what questions everyone has on this process, because again, I know that it's not that common. I'm just gonna check my Skype real quick to make sure there's everyone is muted. Hopefully there's no, is everyone doing okay on um, sound? Everyone can see my presentation. Just a couple people can Skype in the text box. Perfect. Okay. So moving on, the um, other piece that's going to be uh, rolled out eventually in the guidelines or as a separate document is year-round grants. Um, we had a lot of questions come through when the elimination of reallocation ended and funds can be used through the summer saying, hey, how do we do this? How are we going to administer this? And so we have been working with the data subcollection committee, which is um, charged by the Financial Aid Advisory Committee to give input from a variety of schools on how to do things. So the coordinating board likes to get input from a lot of people before we make decisions on doing things. That way we understand, again, how would it impact each individual type of school, not just one school or um, just the, the coordinating board in general. So. This committee uh, got together to try and release 1819 grant guidance, and that was sent out, I believe, last week. I apologize, I don't know the date, um, but it is, I will show you on, I like to show people things in live here. So again, going back to our student financial aid programs webpage, if you go to stay connected, if you're not familiar with this, we do post our most recent communications and on 5-9, we did send out the 1819 year round grant guidance. Um, within this memo, we did have an attachment at the bottom and I would highly encourage you to go out to the website and print this. I'm not going to go through it. Um, today, but it is the PowerPoint presentation does align with this document and it goes through three main topics. 
Um, the first is going to be talking about um, the summer awards and basically eligibility. So the eligibility requirements for summer awarding is not changing for 1819. So you're going to look at all the same things you would for your fall and spring students. For example, you're going to check selective service, your favorite, you're going to check their uh, to make sure that they're a Texas resident. You're going to be making sure that um, they meet the drug conviction piece or the elig statement of eligibility if it applies to those programs. Um, so you're going to go through all the normal things. So one of the things that came up was, okay, well, how do we handle enrollment status because of summer terms? And since summer terms vary in length and different schools have different ways to calculate the uh, courses and some schools only allow students to take a certain number of courses each summer. Um, we, we did send out guidance saying that you can combine your summer quarters, summer semesters, or modules to meet the minimum enrollment standard. So in this example, we have Texas Grant. Um, I have six in summer one and three in summer two, so nine total. They're meeting the three-quarter requirement. TEOG, they still have to be half time. So in this example, they're taking a two credit class, four credit class, and TEG, um, we have a three credit class and then six in the summer too. So again, I realize some people have mini masters, you have all sorts of varieties where you could do that. So you just have to determine at your institution how you will do that to confirm their eligibility, whether that's you wait till the end to pay them, you pay them up front. But no matter what, if the student fails to enroll or drops hours and for the entire semester, summer they're not meeting that you do have to meet the timely disbursement rules that are published in rule so that was one of the pieces that was addressed in the guidance that came out the other thing was a clarification on award amounts so um, one of the things in previous years was we used to release award amounts for the year well now that we're awarding through the summer in two of the programs, the Texas Education Code and Administrative Code allow the Texas Grant and TEOG programs, those are done by a semester award maximum versus an annual award maximum. So one of the things that we sent out was to clarify that for the two grant programs, Texas Grant TEOG, that you can get three awards per year, so fall, spring, and summer, but you cannot exceed the semester award maximum that are published. So um, for example, in 2018-19, we had released that the semester maximum was 4,674. So now the student could get 4,674 per semester. So um, as you can imagine, that's a lot higher than we used to release. So going forward, what you're going to find is when we release those annual notifications, we're going to be sending out semester maximums, and then you will calculate that total um, for the award year. We do still highly encourage the target amount. So that would mean that for the Texas Grant, T Texas Grant program, you could do 2,500 for fall, spring, and summer. So 7,500 7, total for the year. And then of course, um, you can go above that amount if you choose to, but you can never exceed the 4,674. Now for TEOG, you know, each type of school that does that grant program has a different semester maximum. So again, you can award up to that maximum and it is based on the census date. So you would have to use their enrollment status to determine that amount. Now with TEG, in statute, it lists an annual award amount. So really nothing has changed for TEG, but you may want to review your packaging philosophy if you choose to award students in the summertime, because that will mean that for 1819, students who have received 3364 would not be able to get any additional funding because they've already reached their maximum for the year. Um, again, with this philosophy, you can kind of choose how you're going to award from semester to semester. There's no set amount. So you may have one semester where it's $1,000 and the next one it's the difference. You can now break it into three. There's no, um, there's no set amount that you have to abide by. So it's just really just sitting down and determining how you're going to do that if you choose to do summer awarding. Um, so I hope that that is clear. 
For 1920, we will be working with the Data Subcollection Committee to come out with a much more extensive document that covers all of the areas. Um, the biggest one that has come up in the guidelines is how is SAP going to be handled? So what we decided was for 1819, if an institution pays a student in the summer, you do have to include those attempted credits in their SAP calculation. So um, that would mean that if it's an initial year student, you include those credits based on your institutional SAP policy. If they're up for renewal, then you would have to use the program SAP, but you have to include those credits. If the student does not receive grant funding for the summer terms, then um, you, you will basically use the same process that you've always used. We're not changing any uh, philosophies there. You'll use summer coursework if it's going to help regain eligibility or reestablish eligibility. If they take coursework and it's not going to benefit the student and they would lose eligibility, then you would not include that for the fall term. Again, this is for 1819 only. I cannot tell you if it will change for 1920 because those decisions have not been made yet. So once that is finalized, we will be sending that out. Um, and I believe the next meeting with the Data Subcollection Committee is coming up in the first or second week in June, and we should know more after that point. Okay, so now that we've talked about authority to transfer, how you could potentially have more money um, to move into your grant program, uh, we talked about the fact that you can use funding through the summer. What if you come up with money and you're like, hey, I don't know, we don't have any eligible people. How do we find these people? So um, one of the things that we want to encourage people to do is use the award history process. If you're new to an institution or you're new to state financial aid, you may not be aware of this process or this database that the coordinating board has. So I wanted to show you that today. Um, there's two ways that you can look up award history information for the grant programs. So if you administer a Texas grant, TEOG or TEG, you can either do option A, which is to log into our CB Pass portal. And again, because I like to show you all everything live, I'm going to show you where to find that. So I always go to my SFAP page. When you go to program resources, each of the grant programs has a red link underneath each one. And these are the login screens that uh, you'll use to access the portal and the database. Um, if you don't have access to this, you'll just simply create one now. You'll fill in all the information. And then once it comes through to the coordinating board, uh, we will approve your account or potentially your director will ap approve your account. It depends on how your school is set up. Once you log into the screen, um, a, a screen like this down here shows up and it lists uh, up to six social security numbers that you can type in. You can do a search over here by last name, first name, and date of birth. And then it will pull information for you that way. So if you only have one or two students and you want to see if they attended another school and received grant funding, you could go into this portal to use that. Now, if you want to run your entire population, there's another process you can do, which is through our Move It DMZ system. Um, what you would have to do is create a file, and I'm actually going to show you that as well. Going back to the website, if you go down to the Grant Award History File Instructions, this allows you to create a file within your system and you can submit that through Move It, and it will it will send you a file back through the system to tell you um, if it was able to locate those students in our database. So it's really a great way to identify TEOG transfers if you administer Texas grant. If you've got um, your Texas grant population, you can run those to see if they came from another university where they got Texas grant. Um, so I would, again, recommend doing this process by going to download these instructions and going through them. They have screenshots on exactly how to, how to work that process. Um, once you submit the file through Move It, you'll get a notification. And then once you get the results, it will be downloadable through Move It DMZ. 
And one of the nice parts about this file when you download it is that you can export it to Excel to manipulate the file better and review it. Um, so that's one of the reasons I like it. It's a common delimited file. So once you get it, you'll export that. Um, let me go back to my PowerPoint. So when you get the results, this is typically what the three programs look like. It includes, they're not all exactly the same because of different program requirements, but it has the student's information, when they last attended, um, whether they were meeting SAP or not, their attempted hours. So again, it's a, a really great tool to use to not only determine if your current population is in our database correctly and if they're still eligible, but making sure that you identify people who are transferring to your institution that you maybe didn't self-identify. So you may be wondering if you're new, well, I don't have access to any of those things you talked about. What in the world? Like, how do I get access to that? So the last thing that I wanted to go through is user access and not only talking about how to do how to request access, but why is it so critical? <laughs> um, I did talk about this previously, but just want to reinforce that since we get a lot of notifications that we've got new directors, we've got new staff, we've got changes um, going over going on at all these institutions. So um, just reminding people that if we're not notified of these changes, then your staff members or directors who retire, people who leave, they still have access to coordinating board portals. And that again is um, a risk. So we rely on the institutions to tell us when people leave and when they need access. So the way to do that is you're going to go onto our website um, again, this is the pictures, but I'm going to show you live. Um, so when you're on our SFAP site, you go all the way back to the home page here. So from the home page, scroll down to online resources. And then at the under the form section, there's a system authorization form. So when you click on this, the form has to be filled out by a director or hire. Uh, they would fill out the information here and electronically sign it. And then on the second page is where you indicate if you're adding access, you're updating access. For example, if someone's name changed, their title changed, that's where we capture that here. And then um, the removing access would be for HelmNet if somebody leaves or no longer needs access to the loan portal or that CB Pass account that I just showed you to do the award history or to request funding. And then Move It DMZ. Move It is a institution specific account, but we do allow people to add designees so that more than one person can request information, their login information or reset passwords. So um, if you're going to add designees, remove designees or update them, we have a kind of a spot for everything on this form. Um, once the form is e-signed and filled in completely, you can submit that electronically by clicking the submit button. We have received feedback that it doesn't always work depending on the browser. So if you're unable to submit this form online using this tool, then you can physically print it out, sign it and scan it into us and then simply uh, email it to our user access inbox and we will process that. Once the accounts on the form are processed, you'll receive an email letting you know and then the, uh, the account holders will also receive an email with either their, their updated credential or their new account. Um, obviously, if they leave, they're not going to get anything. We'll just simply delete them out of the system. Um, but again, this, this form is very critical to making sure that our, our information is safe and secure. Uh, for your institution. So again, if you know someone is retiring, you know someone is leaving, or you have new staff members and you need them to have access, you, you can go on to our website, download this form and send it in. And if you have general information or requests, like for instance, you get locked out of your account, um, you can send that through that same email box, the user access email account so that we can get get you back on your feet and back into these systems faster. So that's how you do that. Okay, moving on, kind of towards the end. Okay, I have that slide there, but just wait, 
I'm going to keep going. I'm going to circle back at the end because you may have questions about my next slide too. So um, I know y'all are excited to ask me questions. Okay, upcoming events and important dates. So a couple things uh, on updates. We did release the Good Neighbor Scholarship selected recipients. As you may know, Good Neighbor is not technically a scholarship because the state doesn't issue out any money for that. It's an exemption program. And so we did send out that notice to the submitter. So whoever that is, it's typically the international office, but we're finding more and more financial aid offices getting involved in the process. So I just wanted to make sure that people were aware that that was sent out in the event that your person left, they're on vacation, um, you didn't know that it was sent. Again, it's an automated email. So if you are curious, you can always reach out to me. I'm kind of the, the, the point person on Good Neighbor this year. So if you have questions on the selection process or who was selected, please let me know. But that was sent to each institution that submitted eligible applicants. Um, the allocations, they are coming soon. We have done almost all of the reviews at this point. We've done the 10 day review process and uh, one of them just wrapped up. So once we receive all the inquiries, we can consolidate, reconcile, do everything. We will update the calculations. Um, there is one program that still requires a 10 day review, which is the TEG program. So those will go out once they're available. And then um, once the session ends and we have the final totals, we will be sending the final allocation amounts out to the schools. So I just wanted to let you know it's coming. Uh, we do we are kind of at the mercy of the session so that we can get those final totals um, for the allocations and the appropriations. Um, net price calculator update. We've had people inquiring on the institutional calendar. It's showing the end of the month is the deadline. But you may be like, wait a minute, I've never even seen something come out. And I'm like, well, you're right. We have been testing and testing and getting approval for the net price this year for our rollover, and it is still pending. So nothing has gone out yet, and I wanted to communicate. We are going to send something out formally, just letting people know that it's um, still being updated. But if you are wondering where it's at, it has not been released yet. So some schools have called and said, hey, well, I've already updated my stuff. Um, you can upload your information in there. The issue is going to be it's it's not rolled over yet. So there's no way for the end user to see the data until all the pieces are approved. So we do highly encourage you to wait on submitting that until we send it out. Otherwise, you may have to do it again. So um, we will reach out to schools that have already submitted it just to walk through the process again once it's approved, but it has not formally gone out yet. And so once we do release it, we'll, we'll give you the upload deadline. Um, it won't be the, the May 31st that's on the institutional calendar. The upcoming training, um, we have New Aid Officer Workshop coming up. It's in Frisco at the Great Wolf Lodge. That's hosted through the TASFA organization. Um, if you're interested in attending, you can go to their website, but the coordinating board will be there presenting on eligibility and then some uh, resource information. Uh, we do two presentations at that workshop each year. Um, again, if you go to tasfa.org and it's T-A-S-F-A-A, -A -A, <laughs> uh, you can get information on that training. And then of course, our lovely webcast will be next next month on June 11th, same time, two o'clock with me. Um, we have a variety of topics that we plan to discuss, the main one being FADS, um, so financial aid database. So if you are involved in FADS, we will have some topics related to that. And then of course, I will send out a flyer or a notification with the other topics if we have those. And we'll send those out approximately two weeks in advance. Um, some important dates coming up. The Financial Aid Advisory Committee quarterly meeting is on June 6th. That's here at the Coordinating Board. It's a public meeting, so you can either come in person to watch or you can log in via broadcast. Um, the link to the broadcast is made available on the same day, and it's, list it's on our agency website um, on just the main page. And 
Again, um, if you're not able to attend, you can always watch the quarterly meetings. They record the broadcasts and they post them online. And since you know I like to show you everything live, let me do that now. So if you go to our site, you can either go through our main page. We have our Stay Connected. If you go down, we have our Financial Aid Advisory Committee here. We list all the prior broadcasts, all the meeting minutes, agendas, all the information you could possibly want. And then we also have this calendar here where you can see upcoming meetings for the year. So you can see we have June 6, September, and November coming up. So that is something you'll want to tune in for. Our FAD Cycle 2 opens up June 10th. So I know we just wrapped up Cycle 1, um, but hopefully everyone's getting prepared for Cycle 2. So again, we will be talking about that on next webcast. So um, we'll be talking about reconciliation and any questions people have on the process. So definitely, if your FADS representative is not on the phone, then maybe have them join next month. And then finally, a reminder, the legislative session officially ends on May 27th, which is a holiday, um, but that's on their calendar is the date that it will end. So we anticipate that it will wrap up the end of May. Um, lastly, contact information. Um, you can always call Financial Aid Services with questions. We are here from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Our number is 844-792-2640. Um, we have five staff members throughout the day that can answer your call. You can always send a contact us that I showed you at the beginning of the presentation. Um, a lot of times it's better to send something in writing. That way we can review your request and get back to you in writing. But you also can call if it's something that um, you just need clarification on or eligibility, feel free to do that. And then lastly, my contact information. Um, you can email me, uh, my email's here at the top, and I also has a, have a survey here. We've received a few, I would love to see more. Uh, it gives me ideas on what y'all want training on, what some topics may be, and of course my overall delivery to you guys and whether this is a valuable tool to deliver information. So I really appreciate that feedback if you can do that. And then I have our information lines here. Please encourage your students to call the TFAC line. Um, it is dedicated to students with eligibility questions. Uh, we have our borrower services lines if it's related to loans, which is on all of their outgoing correspondence, like letters and, of course, on HH loans. But this is this is specifically for eligibility, and we, we typically get calls for students that are not in school yet on this line, but you can have them call us um, if needed. But I think that's it. I'm going to circle back to my lovely questions. Um, what I, I'm going to try and keep this organized this time. I'm going to open up the topics one at a time so we can discuss them instead of having questions on each of the categories and then they're all over the place. Um, so what I like to start with is, are there any questions related to the session that I can answer? I am not an expert on the legislative session, but if I can, I will. So I'm going to start with that and give people a minute. I see people typing, so that's some indication. Something's coming through. Okay, so I have, will the deadline be extended? That one came through a minute ago. I'm assuming that's on net price calculator, Kathy Wright. And if so, then yes, because we will have to extend that out once we release it. So yes. Any questions on the session? Be on time. Eileen. What is the question on be on time? Is it related to a bill? Is bot coming back? I do not have the answer to that. I wish I did. <laughs> oh, but if you are interested in either bill information or where it's at in the session, you could send that through contact us and then I can give you an update if I, if I can get that from our team that's dealing with the session. So I, ha I do not have an answer on that. Great, but thank you for asking. Okay, Texas A&M Kingsville. 
For the year-round grant, since students must be enrolled for nine hours, at what point do you recommend that we disperse the summer grant funding for students who are enrolled six hours for summer, three for summer two? If up front, what happens if the student completes summer one and then drops summer two before it starts? Are we required to cancel the award? So um, earlier I had mentioned that we did not provide guidance on when to disperse funding, um, only that you confirm eligibility. It's based on my understanding that different schools do it different ways. Some require the student to enroll up front for both summer. Some, they have different um, census periods for summer. There's all sorts of details. So uh, it really is up to your school on how you will decide to determine eligibility but if they don't start summer two or they drop the courses and therefore for the summer you determine they're not eligible, you would have to cancel the award. So you can't, the student can't keep money if they didn't meet the eligibility requirement, but you still again have some flexibility to decide when that is based on your school census date and when you package or when they can sign up for courses. Again, we we will for 1920. We're trying to provide more beef and more more detailed guidance, but for this year, we're leaving that to the institutions to really calculate. Did I answer your question? Y'all totally jumped categories on me. The by the way. So that being said, any other year-round grants? I'm trying to keep the questions related I see people typing so I'm just gonna assume that it's about year-round grants or the session I think we wrapped up on the session already didn't get a lot of a lot of bites on that one okay I like I said, I can tell people are typing. In the event you're on and you don't have questions, feel free. We're This is the end of the presentation where I just go through questions. Um, okay, Giselle, for summer coursework not funded using grants should not be used to recalculate SAP. If attempted credits will result in the student losing, what constitutes state grants? Does this include institutional and federal grants? No, this is only Texas grant, TEOG, and TEG. And these, the SAP that I was referring to is related to the program. So if you have standards for your federal or institutional funds, that would not apply to these. This is specific to state grant funding. Did I answer your question? Is TPEG included? No, TPEG is an institutionally uh, administered grant program. So institutions determine how they spend their TPEG. And there's no restriction on TPEG. I mean, institutions determine eligibility, determine award amounts, as long as it doesn't exceed, it exceed the student's need. Okay, I still see people typing. Y'all are sending me some good questions. Okay, I see people, some people are dropping off, so that some of the questions are dying down. Norma, is select a service statement still needed if we confirm registration through the selective service website? And the answer is it depends on which population of students you're referring to. You do have to collect the statement if the ICER is rejected and there, therefore there is no status on their ICER you would collect the statement and then you would go to the website to print the physical registration confirmation to put in the student's file. If it's a TASFA student or an institutional aid student where they're receiving state funds, then you do have to collect the statement and the corresponding documentation, whether that's the registration or whether that's something showing that they're exempt. 
Um, and so, it, again, I think the answer is it depends on what the situation is. But the most students that go through the normal FAFSA process or are going to be confirmed through their ICER, and so you would not need a statement or any documentation if they come back registered. Did that answer your question, Norma? And if not, then we could always set up time to talk. Okay, good. She said yes. Any other questions? I do see people still typing. And we have about nine minutes left allotted for the webcast, so I will keep answering as long as we have time for, or until people stop typing. <laughs> Okay, Mary, on user access, where can we find out who has what access for our school? Um, if you send something through user access, we can submit, we can send out a list of our current users um, to you. And then once a year, we do an annual user access confirmation process where we send out all the users to all schools to confirm and clean up uh, our portals. So that's typically in the fall between October and December. Um, so that's two answers. We do it annually. We send it out automatically to the schools and we require schools to do that. But at any point during the year, you could send a request through user access and we can send you what we have on file. Okay, the next question. For the transfer of funds from work study to grants, does that include work study mentorship as well? Not that I am aware of. I do not think that the mentorship funds can be moved into your grant program, but since it's technically an offset of the program, I will find out. So I know, I believe Deshay was on the call. She may have an answer. Um, I don't know if she's still on. So I will get back with you. That's Stephen F. Austin, correct? SFA could totally be student financial aid. <laughs> okay, I'll confirm that and let y'all know. All right, I see the dots dying down on typing. Uh, any other questions we have? So we've talked about the authority to transfer, year round, user access, the legislative session, any guideline questions? or anything on the deadlines, training. It's free for all at this point, so. Okay, Giselle, if a student attends the summer to regain their Texas grant eligibility and meets eligibility requirements at the end of the summer, but they were not awarded state grants, would we be able to consider the student meeting eligibility at the end of summer? And the answer was yes. If, the, if that's the way you've been administering it up until now, you continue to do that. And that's the guidance we've previously given um, for many years is that if the credits they take in the summer help to regain eligibility, then you can include those if they if they were to take the student's eligibility away and impact their fall award then you would not include them if they're not getting award if they are getting money for the summer now for one of the three grant programs you have to include it now and that's for the 1819 award year 1920 guidance has not been released yet on the sap Okay. Did that answer your question, Giselle? Great. Okay, so we have a few minutes left. Any more takers? Again, I highly encourage you to use the contact methods. You can either use contact us. You have my email. Um, I do request that you use contact us so that they can actually get to the appropriate person faster. If you send it to me and I'm on vacation or out of the office, then um, it will just slow you down. So you can use that again, our institutional phone line. 
is also an option. One last question. When will 1920 Texas grant guidelines be posted? (laughs) So those are set to go out this week. We will send out a notification to all institutions and then we will post them on the SFAP website under program resources. So keep an eye out for those, but they are approved. We're just doing the final stages, which includes we have to make them accessible for our website. And then once they're done, they will be out there. So keep an eye out any day now. I'm getting all the goods from Miss Giselle. She's asking lots of questions. Anyone else? All right. Well, we only have a couple minutes left, so I am going to bid you farewell. I hope that this was useful and that you got some good stuff. Um, We will post this. Um, online and send out a a notification once it's available. We'll be posting the PowerPoint as well as the recorded webcast uh, under the Stay Connected page. And again, if you have additional questions, scenario questions, please send those through Contact Us, and I will talk to you soon. So thank you so much for joining. Have a wonderful day.